Welcome to the SDG Media Zone, where we're kicking off the 10th annual UN Youth Forum with conversations on advancing the sustainable development goals as the world responds and recovers from the COVID-19 crisis. We'll be tackling some of the most defining issues affecting young people today, such as climate change, reducing inequalities and mental health. So how can young people rise from the chaos and the devastation of the pandemic to build a fairer world and a more sustainable future? In this conversation, we're going to hear from the UN's Youth Envoy and two inspiring young activists who are transforming the world. And we're gonna find out what they think, what they want the Youth Forum to achieve and how the United Nations can support their aspirations to reimagine, recover and rebuild. And we're gonna start with Malati Weissen, co-founder of Youthtopia and also a keynote Youth Forum speaker this year. Hi. So Malati, uh, first of all, where are you with and that wonderful background? I am currently recording in from Bali, Indonesia, and uh, we're at the headquarters space where we have this lovely virtual, uh, real painting background uh, of a rainforest. So Malati, tell us about Utopia. So Utopia, well, I can't tell you the story of Utopia without going back in time seven years ago, almost eight, when I was 12 years old. That was the start of my journey as a young activist and change maker without even knowing what that was at the time. But I had the clear vision to go out there and create a change. What that change was at the time was plastic pollution, specifically towards plastic bags on the island of Bali through my first NGO and organization, Bye Bye Plastic Bags. Through that experience, and it kind of acts as a vehicle of where Utopia is today. Um, through that experience, I've had the immense privilege to speak to over half a million students and young people um, on and offline. Anywhere and always, there was one question. How can I do what you do? And that's where Utopia comes in because we believe that all of you young people can do what we do. Utopia is all about youth empowerment through peer-to-peer programs, collaboration, and education. So we create um, short and meaningful programs with frontline young change makers who have the experience, who have the knowledge, and bundle it up in a way that the rising young change maker who is asking that question can learn from a peer their age um, doing something incredible. How difficult was it to get this ban in place? I mean, and, and also, how bad was the problem? Well, the, the problem was just, I mean, enormous. I, imagine it was as bad enough to make 10 and 12 year olds just furious about the issue and enough for us to be like, this isn't rocket science. We know there's a problem. So here, especially Bali, Indonesia, we're the second largest source of marine plastic pollution in the world. Um, so it, it wasn't rocket science. It was a, a, an issue we couldn't escape. So uh, we said enough and the rest is pretty much history. The ban uh, took way too long, um, you know, six years years of us at the front lines, but collaborating and working together with many like-minded organizations to finally, in 2019, achieve the ban in, on plastic bags, straws, and styrofoam um, in 2019. Well, you've clearly had an influence on the political class. should mention that you are a 2019 uh, most influential teen in the world as on a by time. So you've, as I say, you've influenced the political class. Do you think you've influenced the wider population? Have attitudes changed? Um, I would like to say yes, but I also know that there is so much work to be done in changing mindsets. That's a lifelong journey. I do believe that's why we focus on young people because there is an opportunity here where we can accelerate that progress and actually accelerate the change we wanna see because as young people, we don't look at a challenge, we see an opportunity instead. Um, you know, We change any linear uh, system into a circular one. We look at um, issues and we turn them into innovation. So I think that uh, the reason why we tackle young people is because exactly to that purpose and point, we believe we can accelerate that mindset in order to actually implement change. Um, so yes, I do think the people of Bali are ready and willing to change, but there's still so much work that we need to do. And that's why we focus on empowering every single young person to become a young change maker. Well, congratulations on what you've achieved so far. And of course, we look forward to hearing you at the Youth Forum. I'm going to turn now to Anika Jane, former executive director of Green Congress in Kenya, also a keynote speaker, and uh, someone who has trained under influential women leaders on politics and feminism and is part of the UN 
Women's Global Youth Task Force of the Beijing Plus 25 Review, the African Women Leadership Network, and a One East Africa champion, where she lobbies decision makers in an effort to create changes needed for gender equality. Hello, Anika. Hi, how are you? Very well. well. Let's talk a bit more about your experience in politics and experience as a young woman in politics in Kenya. Uh, tell us how your story began. Well, my story began when I was in first year, actually. I, I joined uh, the University of Nairobi in the year 2010, and um, there was already an accommodation crisis. And, uh, you know, my fellow young uh, women were stranded, and I was able to speak to them. And someone in the crowd said, I think you can be a great leader and asked me to run for office barely one week just into campus. Of course, I, I didn't win because I was really new. But in the second year, I decided to run for a, a, you know, a big position, which was vice chair. And in this process, I realized that there are not many women who are running for these positions. The issues are structural, they're patriarchal, and it's really competitive, and it's really mad by a lot of violence. So I really wanted to change the narrative because in an executive of 19, only three seats was reserved for women. And so when we changed our constitution in Kenya, we were changing each public uh, institution to be to replicate the national constitution and the student um, council was changing its constitution. I got the privilege to be the chair of that constitution review and reserved five seats for women and created the position of opposite uh, gender running mate for the president and vice president. And that meant that in the next year, for the first time, we had a deputy vice president of the students council. And today, as we speak, the chair of the student council for the first time is a woman. So that is how I started getting involved in politics. And climate change um, sort of got me into that space because I was really working with communities at the grassroots. And when the Green Party of Kenya was being formed, uh, somebody told somebody that there's someone who's really passionate and is doing great work in communities and would be great for the Green Party. And so I came onto the Green Congress of Kenya, working with women at the grassroots, creating a replica of Wangari Madai's Green Belt using the churches and urging young people to be environmentally conscious. And that has been my journey so far. And I now sit on the board of political parties. And that is how I created the Young Women in Political Parties Leadership, because as much as we want women in elective seats, we need to create structures that support women into these offices. Now, of course, one of the main UN buildings is in Kenya. Um, have you had much contact with them? Has that been a, a, useful to you in your aims in terms of getting more women into politics and to advancing climate action agendas? Yes. Um, the UN, uh, it's UNON, uh, and which also headquarters UNEP in Nairobi, has actually been really supportive towards women political participation. One thing that we are looking forward to now is involving political parties more because in, in achieving the two-thirds gender rule, which is entrenched in our constitution, the Supreme Court ruling said it has to come from political parties because political parties are the ones that front candidates. And so we are looking at a revolution, a reconstitution of the political parties primaries process and ensuring that women are in spaces of leadership. They are running prim uh, party primaries to ensure that the structural issues that women face are not repeated in the next general election. Thank you very much, Anika. And well, let's turn now to Jayathma, Jayathma Wickramaniake, our youth envoy. Um, you've been listening to many young people like Malati and Anika during your time as youth envoy. Give me your first thoughts on what you've been hearing during this conversation. Are you inspired for the future? Are you confident that people, younger people can make positive change? Thanks, Corner. I, I definitely am. And I'm really excited for the actual forum to hear the perspectives that Anika and Malati and, and the other young people who will come with them will bring to these conversations. Um, I think the past few years has seen an unprecedented increase 
of recognizing young people's leadership, supporting youth leadership, um, including through the United Nations, through our youth strategy, Youth 2030, which aims to bring voices like Anika's, voices like Melati's into the halls of power, into the decision-making rooms to be able to bring about transformational change. And I think Melati was talking about how progress has been so slow in the past years. And as young people, for us, these issues of climate, environment, recovery from COVID-19, the political crisis that our world is seeing today, these are issues about our survival, the survival of our generation. So we cannot wait for incremental progress. We need transformational progress. And this is what as a generation we are trying to push for. So I'm really glad that we'll be having Anika and Melati and about 10,000 young people come together virtually to the United Nations on the 7th and 8th of April to have these conversations, to push ministers, head of states, leaders, policymakers into this direction. Melati spoke about how young people always see challenges as opportunities. And I think that's exactly what we also want to achieve through the forum. Um, I know a lot of people are anxious that we only have 10 years only left to achieve the sustainable development goals. But we are saying, look, we have 10 more years and let's channel all our energy, let's channel all our resources so that we live up to the commitments that were made back in 2015. Um, I also want to make a note that Anika Malati and many of the people who are holding sort of leadership positions in the political movements, in the climate movement right now are women young women and the way that these young women particularly young women of color as the three young women of color you see on this screen the way they're breaking stereotypes and reclaiming their space and power is i think a force to be reckoned with you mentioned a lot of topics there jayathma uh, but are there some priorities some particular themes that you'll be focusing on at this year's youth forum Definitely. So one of the things that we always want to do is make sure that not young people are speaking to each other alone and not decision makers are speaking to each other alone. So we are bringing together youth ministers and young people to the same forum at the United Nations. So this is the largest gathering of young people that happens annually at the United Nations. But the title can be misleading because we call it the Youth Forum, but no, it's a forum where young people and ministers meet together, discuss together, dialogue together and debate together with the end idea of pushing through some transformational solutions that will feed into the intergovernmental process on sustainable development goals. So at the end of 8th of April, we are not going to pat each other's back, say that we had a nice conversation, clap our hands and go home. No, we will push through these solutions. We will push through these ideas to the high level political forum in July. I think you very nicely summed up the uh, the, the huge task ahead of them of everybody because you said yourself you do want transformational change everybody wants change now yet as you just laid out it's a very complex process to bring all these different themes together and also to bring them down to a regional level as well but let me just ask Merlati and uh, Annika all of these things that you heard from Jayathma just now give me one thing that you would like to see one concrete thing that you'd like to see come out of this year's youth forum. Merlati well, first. Suffer. Okay, I'll take it first. I think, um, Jackma, again, I'm so just so in awe hearing you kind of so eloquently um, picture and piece all of these massive uh, tasks that we have ahead of us in such a way where everybody at the end just feels like, okay, we got this, we got to do it. And, um, you know, one thing that I really like that you said is that it's not just a pat on the back at the end of the conference where we say, yeah, good job, great, let's see you next year. I think what I really want to see is actually accountability, track record, how do we progress, uh, how do we measure measure our progress and what happens if we don't reach our goals. I think that dialogue of young people to ministers or young people to government or young people to scientists, young people to community is really the first step for inspiration, for motivation, for you know, lifting up the mood that we can do this. But then the aftermath is the important part of how we track our impact and what we do afterwards if we're not reaching them, if we have to reassess. So I think that's what I hope to see out of um, this year's event. And Anika? Uh, what I hope to see is an urgent need and radical change 
in institutionalization of young people's leadership, not just in high level spaces as speakers, but in government, high level spaces of government and ministries and decision making. This is important because as we are planning to build back better, we say that there's nothing for us that can be done without us. The youth is the most critical constituency in COVID that has been hit hard. This involves our girls, uh, not going back to school and our young people who have lost their jobs because they're at the bottom of the pyramid. So let us not build back without representation from this critical constituency. Because once young people are there, they'll be able to adequately direct resourcing. Young people at the grassroots, at the communities need urgent direct and unrestricted funding for them to be able to get out of um, the mess that COVID has put us in. I'll just leave the last word to Jayathma. Now, Jayathma, I'm sure you couldn't have foreseen that we would be looking again at a virtual youth forum in this unprecedented time. Uh, to what extent has this overturned the aspirations that you had uh, for the empowerment of youth? And, and is there anything positive you've seen come out of this? Look, there's, there's two sides to it. I'm honestly upset because we cannot have the forum the way we wanted because we wanted young people to come into the United Nations, walk into these rooms, meet the policymakers face to face, you know, have that conversation. And Malathi and Anika would tell me that there's nothing like having that sort of eye contact when you hold a policymaker to uh, accountable and, and ask those difficult questions from them. Um, However, this is the reality that we live in and we have to adapt and we have to find ways to make it work. So, so we've come up with a formula, a way that, um, that this format can give us the best results that we can, we can have at, at this point of time. But on the other side, I also see how this has democratized access for young people to the UN. If we had this forum in person, maximum number of young people we would have is 1,500 to 2,000 in the UN. Because traveling to New York is expensive. Food and lodging in New York is expensive. Not everyone can get a visa to enter into the United States. So thinking that way, right now we are able to host 10,000 young people in a virtual platform to have this conversation. So even though we will be missing out on the in-person element of the conversation, I think we are doing a far greater service by opening up the doors of the United Nations to an unprecedented number of young people to virtually come into these halls and to hold policymakers accountable. So uh, as that, as Anika and Malati were saying, we always try to see the sort of the silver lining in the dark clouds, and we are we are trying to do the same with the with the forum as well to to find ways uh, to make these presentations, to make these conversations as interactive and as um, impactful and effective as much as possible. Um, we want to make sure. I think really two things. One is accountability, as both Melati and Anika has been saying, accountability for the commitments that governments have made in terms of the sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement. In every agreement, they refer to young people as torchbearers of the future and you know the, the, the leaders of today and the leaders of tomorrow. But if you do not live up to the commitments that you have made, you're not going to have a world for these young people to lead. Um, so we are really asking for basic things, our basic rights, our basic aspirations to have a future that is not uncertain, a, a planet that is healthy for us to live in, a governance system that is not crumbling in front of our eyes before we even attain our voting age. Um, so really, really, the, the key ask, the key demand is accountability. And two is recognizing youth leadership, not seeing young people as adults in training, recognizing their agency, recognizing that they are capable of making decisions for themselves about their own bodies, about their own lives, and about their communities and the issues that those communities are facing. So channeling resources directly to youth-led solutions, youth-led innovations, uh, both financial and non-financial resources, and finally, creating safe spaces for young people to operate in. We see leaders, including the United Nations, always asking young people to speak up 
But when young people speak up and they face retaliation from their governments and other actors, you know, we tend to be silent and we cannot do that anymore. If we are asking young people to be activists, then we should create spaces online and offline that are safe for them to be activists. So I would say these are the key aims for us as the UN, per the United Nations Youth Strategy that we want to achieve. And I'm sure that with people like Malathi and Anika and the 10,000 other young people on board, and we currently have over 60 ministers confirmed, ministers responsible for youth affairs, who are often also left out of conversations on climate and sustainable development, to bring them also into these conversations and forge this partnership between, intergenerational partnership between ministers and youth organizations for us to be able to drive this change together. Well, I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating youth forum. Thank you all for joining us on the SDG Media Zone today. Um, as Jayathma said, there are pros and cons with this kind of conversation. I feel like I've met you all in Bali and Kenya and at the UN. And of course, it's a shame that I can't meet you all for a coffee afterwards. But um, it's going to be wonderful. Thank you very much and have a great youth forum. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.